Welcome back. Now, of course, we were going to hear from the politician and novelist Lord Dobbs, but he's been detained in the Lords with the rather important matter of the Brexit bill. Uh, so I'm delighted to say he's dispatched his Conservative colleague and political polymath, Michael Portillo, in his place. Now, as someone well acquainted with the vicissitudes of political life, he'll speak on the same theme as Lord Dobbs was going to, namely posing the question, is politics stranger than fiction? There's obviously a problem, Lord Dobbs, I'm saying. Yes. In, Port Port in Mr. Portillo's case, the answer would appear to be a resounding yes. Michael Portillo enjoyed an unstoppable ascent in Westminster until he was stopped in his tracks by the British electorate. But he managed to reinvent himself not once, but at least twice. And today, he's a respected broadcaster, political thinker, and general doer. Michael Portillo was first elected to the Commons in a by-election in 1984. A strong admirer of Margaret Thatcher and a leading Eurosceptic, he served as a junior minister under both her and John Major before entering the Cabinet in 1992, eventually becoming Employment Secretary and then Defence Secretary. After being defeated in 1997, he turned to journalism before being re-elected re once again in another by-election, this time in Kensington and Chelsea. After standing unsuccessfully for the Conservative leadership, he left the Commons in 2005 and has since made a string of TV programmes from Portillo Goes Wild in Spain to Great British Railway Journeys. And he's here to tell us about his personal journey and much more besides. So please welcome Michael Portillo. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Cathy, for those kind words of introduction, for making it so obvious to everyone here that I'm a man with an enormous political future behind me. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't mention the highest position that I achieved in public life. I was at one time a future prime minister. I am now a former future prime minister. Uh, we're rather a large number of former future prime ministers in Britain. We formed ourselves into a club of former future prime ministers, and I'm very pleased to be able to tell this audience today that we have recently welcomed as a new member, Mr. Boris Johnson. Uh, yeah, I knew you would uh, share my pleasure at that, but may I say how uh, great plan to echo Build for inviting me here today and uh, plucking me from the obscurity in which I now normally reside. Uh, had you invited me 15 years ago, my name was habitually in headlines, but my name has been in the headline now only once in the last 10 years, running up to the last general election, there was some speculation that a cabinet minister might lose his or her seat at the general election. And the headline appeared, will there be a Portillo moment at this general election? Now, for those of you who don't know what a Portillo moment is, it is journalistic shorthand for a man eating a bucket full of shit in public. Because, uh, and Cassio referred to this, in the 1997 general election, in the full glare of national publicity, I lost my seat in Parliament, lost my ministerial job, lost my chance of leading the Conservative Party, all gone in one humiliating moment. And that moment was subsequently voted by Guardian readers and Channel 4 viewers, their third favourite moment of the 20th century. In that particular uh, poll, in which some of you may have participated enthusiastically, I narrowly beat the assassination of President Ceausescu into fourth place, uh, an achievement of which I feel very, very proud. Uh, and some people have said to me, how was it that your political career ended in such catastrophe? In the intimacy of our gathering today, I'll take you into my confidence. I had this constituency in North London, and on a Saturday I used to go there to a bazaar or a fete, and standing by the tombola one week was a lady who said, would you mind sending me a signed photograph of yourself, please, Mr. Portillo? Which I thought was an eminently reasonable and uh, understandable request. Uh, but I forgot all about it. I wasn't back in my ministerial office until the following Thursday. I used to, I used to work quite a short ministerial week, sort of John Prescott of my day. Uh, and when I got there, there was a letter lying open on the desk. It said, uh, I met you at the tombola. Don't forget the photograph. It was signed Enid Snooks, and in brackets, she'd written horse face. Uh, I was moved. I was moved. Don't, don't titter. I was moved. I, I thought, here's a lady with a lovely, self-deprecating sense of humor. This is by way of a challenge to want to see, do I have a sense of humor? Can I rise to the occasion? And amazingly, fortuitously, I had a photograph of myself on my desk. And I wrote on it to my very dear horse face, with very best wishes from Michael Portillo, 
popped it into the tasteful matching frame that a Michael Portillo photograph comes in, sent it off to Mrs. Snooks, felt great about the whole thing. And then later that day, my personal assistant came in, said, uh, did you see the letter from Mrs. Snooks? I, I said, I did. Wasn't it marvelous? She said, I'm so relieved. I thought you wouldn't remember who Mrs. Snooks was. I trust it was helpful that I wrote horseface after her name in brackets. So I think that pretty much explains uh, my political career to you. Uh, is politics stranger than fiction? The answer is yes. Uh, I would begin with um, the Conservative victory in 2015, which I did not foresee. Uh, I did not foresee it because I believe that the Conservatives were unable to get more than 37% of the vote. And historically speaking, it was impossible to win an overall majority with 37% of the vote. Uh, what I had not anticipated, and this was generally not anticipated, was that the non-Tory vote was so fractured between Scottish nationalists and UKIP uh, and uh, other uh, parties that it was possible under our electoral system for a party to win 37% of the vote and get an overall majority. Uh, indeed, in Scotland, it was possible for a party to get, I think, just shy of 50% of the vote and to take all of the seats uh, except three. And so actually, what we've seen in Britain is not dissimilar from what we've seen in a number of other countries, certainly around Europe, since the uh, recession of uh, 10 years ago, which is to say that the dominance of the main two parties in the political system has been progressively reduced. The number of people voting for the main two parties has been reduced. But whereas in countries like Spain, where you have a proportionate electoral system that has resulted in four major parties vying with each other to see whether they can make coalitions, in the extraordinary circumstances of the British electoral system, first past the post, by the way, a system which I believe in and defend, uh, what has resulted is extraordinarily, effectively, a one-party system, because most people assume at the moment that the Conservatives are also going to win uh, the next general election. But I think it's worth reminding ourselves, is politics stranger than fiction, that the Conservatives, in my view, still face an existential threat. 37% of the vote is much lower than they were scoring two decades ago, 25 years ago, when uh, they would score 42% or 44%. A lot of Conservative voters have disappeared. Conservative Party is poorly represented amongst young people and poorly represented amongst ethnic minorities. These would normally be considered as the conditions in which a party would go into long-term decline. But here we are, extraordinarily, looking, as I say, at something which is uh, a little bit like uh, a one-party state. It was uh, unlucky for David Cameron, in a way, that he won with a majority, because it meant that he had to implement his promise to hold a referendum on the European Union in or out. Uh, he probably thought, when he made the promise, that he would at best be in a coalition government, and the coalition government would not have passed the legislation in order for there to be a referendum. So he was left to implement a referendum. Why on earth did he call it? Uh, well, politics is stranger than fiction. I really don't know why David Cameron uh, called the referendum. Uh, he must have thought there was some political maneuver that he could achieve. He was spooked, I think, by the fact that UKIP was getting a very large number of votes. But why be spooked by that when, as I've said, despite its four million votes, UKIP achieves at best one seat in the House of Commons? That isn't really a result that should spook a prime minister. And so he put us in a position of holding a referendum and doing something which I think is very extraordinary for a person who is in power, which is coming to the British people and saying, I offer you two alternatives, one of which I thoroughly recommend to you, and the other of which will be catastrophic. Which would you like to do? Uh, this is not, in my view, uh, how prime ministers should perform. Uh, neither uh, do I take the view that uh, your only plan B 
uh, is the one that David Cameron had, which was to resign his office by 7 o'clock the morning after the referendum uh, vote. Um, my own view, for what it's worth, is that the European Union, uh, you heard me introduced by Cathy as a Eurosceptic, my own view is that the European Union is a dangerous ideology. It is uh, making relentless progress towards a single European state, something with which I think the vast majority of British people have never been in sympathy. And the reason that this is a dangerous ideology is that it pushes all aside in its attempt to achieve the ideology. So the euro was invented uh, not because the euro makes any economic sense or brings economic benefit. Indeed, it has brought ruin to the southern half of Europe. No, no, the euro was invented because a single currency is a characteristic of a single country, which is what the ambition is. The free movement of people was invented for the same reason. Uh, free movement of people is not necessary for a single market. You might argue that free movement of labor is necessary for a single market. That would be people moving to where there are jobs. But the free movement of people is absolutely not needed for a single market. And the free movement of people has been invented because, again, it is a characteristic of uh, a single nation. So that is the uh, journey on which the European Union is set. And uh, if you want to know why I think the ideology is dangerous, ask the 50% of young people who are unemployed in Italy and the 50% of young people who are unemployed in Spain, and ask the Greeks whose economy has been ruined, reduced in size by about a quarter, ask them uh, if they have not been the casualty of a relentless uh, ideology. But despite my own feelings that this is the character of the European Union, um, I thought a referendum was unnecessary. Why? Because uh, we were not in the Euro, the British were not in the Euro. We weren't part of Schengen, that uh, area of Europe in which people could move around without having to show a passport. Uh, I believe that we were uh, relatively safe from uh, future problems. I think I might say that um, for the European Union, Brexit does not represent an existential threat. But in my view, both the single currency and migration do. Uh, most people say that the euro is unsustainable. But they don't follow through what that means. It means, literally, that it cannot be sustained, that one day it will cease to exist, or cease to exist at least in its present form. And that will be a very traumatic event when European politicians eventually face up to it. And the migration crisis is creating all sorts of political changes across Europe. And I don't think that we have by any means yet seen the end of populist movements uh, in Europe. What are, um, what are our prospects for uh, making a Brexit? Um, I don't think by any means that it's going to be a bed of roses, although I find it hard to predict at the moment how it will turn out. It seems to me that uh, the European Union facing the problem of the euro, facing the problem of migration, and fa facing a third problem, which is the hostility of the President of the United States to the European Union. Uh, Donald Trump believes that the European Union is a German scam. And by the way, I think he has quite a good point. Uh, Germany benefits from the euro because it is a weaker currency than the Deutschmark would be. This enables Germany to export more and to be richer than it would otherwise be. And the contrast is between Germany in the north of Europe uh, with a huge trade surplus and pretty much full employment, and Greece, Italy, and Spain in southern Europe, very much a contrast. Uh, economies uh, which have been stuck for years and very high levels of unemployment. To me, it's, uh, it's a mystery as to why the southern Europeans put up with this. But back to where I was. With the euro, with migration, and with the hostility of the President of the United States, the European Union has quite a range of problems. And you could have two responses to this. You could either say, we have enough problems already. Let us make the most 
easygoing and friendly, amicable arrangement with Britain as Britain leaves the European Union. Or alternatively, you could say, with all these problems, our future really is under threat. We had better get the wagons into a lager. We had better defend ourselves. We'd better treat Britain as though it were an escapee from a prison camp in order to discourage the next lot from going over the wire. And I think you can already see that these two points of view exist in Europe. There'll be now, in my view, um, a couple of years of inconsequential negotiation between officials. On the one hand, foreign office and treasury officials who have spent their life integrating Britain into the European Union, so who are hardly negotiating Brexit you know, from the bottom of their hearts and their souls, and a bunch of European Union officials who are determined to defend the European idea at all costs. Uh, you cannot expect any progress in negotiations between these two sets of people. Uh, and indeed, in a way, there's no need for there to be progress because the decision is reserved to a political decision. A political decision means a decision by politicians. And one of the difficulties is knowing, in knowing how this is all going to work out is that we don't know who the politicians are going to be. We don't know who will be the president of France. We do not know who will be the chancellor of Germany. We do not know how many euro crises we may go through in the next two years. We don't know how many migration crises, how many unemployment crises we may have gone through by the time that this uh, decision is made. Uh, I would say that the rational thing for the European Union to do is to have the amicable settlement. But as you'll have realized from my remarks, uh, I don't have the highest possible opinion of the European Union, and therefore I don't by any means rely on their making a rational decision at the end of this process, which is why indeed uh, the Brexit uh, may be uh, quite hard. Uh, meanwhile, continuing on the theme that politics is stranger than fiction, on the other side of the Atlantic, the uh, Americans elected uh, Donald Trump. Um, this one I did foresee. Uh, I spent quite a lot of the um, summer last year in the United States. Uh, and one thing I observed was that uh, Hillary Clinton was never in the news. And Donald Trump was in the news always, dominating the news broadcast day after day. Not all the news is what we would conventionally regard as good news, but he was the news and she was nowhere. Uh, and the other thing was that opinion polls, for what they're worth, they're not worth so very much, I think, uh, opinion polls told us that the disapproval rating of Hillary Clinton was 70% amongst Americans. And you just wondered how a candidate who had a 70% disapproval rating could possibly uh, be elected. Uh, and uh, indeed, she was not. I found it very interesting during the campaign that Donald Trump was so buoyed up by Brexit. I mean, normally Americans are completely unaware of anything that happens in Europe uh, and anything that happens in uh, Britain. But Brexit somehow was uh, big news. And I think Donald Trump was, uh, was right, analytically right, to be encouraged by Brexit because it suggested that there was an anti-establishment uh, movement afoot it suggested that opinion pollsters were unable to get at the people whose votes uh, mattered in order to uh, get their opinions. He was absolutely right, therefore, to see that there was significance uh, in the uh, Brexit vote. And uh, you know, as we look ahead, um, I mean, really, French politicians uh, seem to be doing all they can to help Marine Le Pen to, to win in France. I don't by any means at this moment predict that Marine Le Pen will be the winner in France, but for the leader of the right to be teetering on the brink of resignation, has he resigned yet? He's still there at the moment, is he? Fillon, uh, Macron, uh, untested, nakedly ambitious, uh, and uh, very young. Uh, certainly the circumstances you know, could not be more propitious for Marine Le Pen. Uh, if Marine Le Pen uh, were to win, I might say that uh, 
Brexit would then seem like a storm in a teacup because Marine Le Pen is uh, in favor of pulling France out of the euro and in favor of holding um, a referendum on continued membership of the European Union. It's perhaps uh, worth saying that um, although I think uh, Europe is under existential, sorry, the European Union is under existential threat, uh, it is not in my view that other countries are going to follow us in Brexit. Uh, I think there is a fundamentally different mentality between Britain and our European Union partners on the continent. Uh, I think this mainly goes back to Second World War experience. Uh, for our European partners, uh, for example, Spain, uh, uh, I have a Spanish passport, so I don't really care what happens. Uh, I, uh, uh, Spain, for example, is uh, amongst those countries. You know, all the European Union countries, uh, I, I, I think this is right, uh, fell to fascism, Nazism, communism, or invasion. And many of them stayed uh, in that state for decades uh, after World War II. Therefore, these countries look to establish, well, they have established, look with pride and pleasure uh, towards a European Union level of institution because their institutions failed. Their freedom, their parliaments, their freedom of speech, their judicial systems, all were swept away and perverted during the course of the 20th century. The British experience was different. Uh, our parliament, our freedom of speech, our free press, our judicial system, uh, none of these things perished during that period. And so British people, I mean, be frank about it, British people do not look to a European level, a European infrastructure of institutions to provide their safety, their security. And I think this mentality, this difference of mentality, is very difficult to get around. So in other words, my interpretation would be that our European Union partners were you know, trying to move in a direction towards ever closer European Union. We, as a nation, were always trying to stop that happening. So we were unhappy because we were being dragged along. They were unhappy because we were trying to stop them. Ah, sometimes uh, I think a divorce is exactly the right thing to do. Let me just say another word about uh, Donald Trump. Um, there's a lot of speculation that Donald Trump is uh, in cahoots in some way uh, with Putin. I would just say that actually what he said, because it's a bit too early for him actually to have done anything, uh, what he's said so far does not imply that he's a softy as far as Russia is concerned. One thing he's done is to increase, or to wish to increase, the American defense budget by an amount which in itself is equal to the defense budget of Russia. The increase in the American defense budget is equal to the defense budget of Russia in total. And the second thing that he's done has been to tell his NATO allies that they must spend up to the NATO target, which is 2% uh, of GDP uh, on defense. Uh, I, I, and personally, I think it is indefensible that Germany, which spends 1.22% of GDP on defense, uh, refuses to move rapidly towards 2%. Um, I think it's indefensible because Germany, as I've said before, is a wealthy country, uh, and also because for uh, decades, uh, American forces stationed in West Germany defended Western Germany against communism uh, from the East. Uh, and I would have thought that a natural sense of obligation uh, would have obliged the Germans to move quickly towards the appropriate NATO target. Um, I'm going to conclude this part. We're going to have some uh, questions in a moment. Notice I don't say questions and answers because I used to be a politician. But, uh, can I just explain to you that my, my career has been in two halves? You know, I began, the first thing I did in my career was to brief Margaret Thatcher for her press conferences in the 1979 general election. And now, as you've heard from Cathy, I make documentaries. Uh, recently, I was in the Kalahari Desert making a documentary about meerkats. Are you familiar with meerkats? Yes? Cute, would you say? Cute? They are dictatorial little bastards. It, because what happens is, in any group of 20 meerkats, a dominant female emerges, Kathy. And this dominant female 
handbags her way to the top. She may drive the other females into the Kalahari Desert where they may well perish. She may eat the pups of the other females to establish a monopoly on breeding. And then, gentlemen, an extraordinary thing happens. The testosterone level of the dominant female rises. The testosterone levels of all the males in the group fall. And this has led me to a much more thorough understanding of Margaret Thatcher's governments than I had ever had before. Um, may I just put in a plug for a TV program I do? Uh, very late at night on uh, Thursdays, BBC One, um, there's a program called This Week. It's political satire. It's been running for 14 years. Uh, for most of that period, it consisted of a Labour MP called Diane Abbott and me sharing a sofa that's far too small for us. Uh, and some people didn't know that Diane and I were at school together. So how can I put this delicately? We share a certain amount of emotional baggage. We know where the bodies are buried, if you get my drift. And so there we were, Diane and I, week after week, in the middle of the night, crammed together on this tiny sofa, surrounded by our emotional baggage. Uh, we knew no one was watching. Uh, and in these circumstances, we became a bit tactile. So I quite like to put my arm around Diane and give her a bit of a squeeze. She quite liked to rub my right knee. And we did audience research. We discovered our audience was 50% insomniac and 50% pervert. I just want to thank all of you if you're regular watchers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Michael. Come and take a seat or, or I think I might stand. stand. Yes, I yes. thought, um, having been compared to a dominant female meerkat, I thought you might take that uh, approach. Ne ne that's never happened to me before. Um, just starting on Brexit, we will take questions from the audience, but I'm just going to kick things off. Um, you admit that Brexit will be quite difficult, which is perhaps surprising for a Eurosceptic. Do you perhaps then agree with your old boss, John Major, who said not so long ago that there were little chance um, that the advantages of being part of the single market could be replicated once the UK leaves? Um, little chance of the advantages of being part of the single market being replicated. I think it's probably a bit early to uh, say that. Um, I think British people as a whole um, tend to perceive our weaknesses rather than our strengths. I mean, as an example of this, um, unbelievably to me, we say, oh my goodness, you know, will the city of London be cut off from European markets? The city of London is the second biggest financial center on the planet. I think there's only one other European center in the top 20, and it is Zurich, which is not even in the European Union. So the question really is, will the European Union choose to cut itself off from the second largest financial center on the planet? I think on the whole, the answer is no. Although, as I said earlier, you know, uh, I think perverse outcomes uh, are likely. But one would have to um, set against what John Major said also, the advantages of being distant from the forthcoming Euro catastrophe, which I think is pretty predictable, and being distant from the forthcoming European migration catastrophe, which I think is also uh, pretty likely to occur. Uh, and um, a, a point that matters to me very much as a former parliamentarian, but which uh, doesn't seem to bother other people quite as much, this puzzles me, is that the big prize is the return of parliamentary sovereignty, accountability. Uh, European institutions are not accountable to us, Everybody admits that in Europe there is a democratic deficit, but they then say, well, there's no way of bridging that. And there isn't, because Europe is not a political space. There's no way you can have an election throughout Europe on a single day that could produce sensibly a European government, because we have such different political cultures. We speak so many different languages. Um, so the more we go towards European integration, the less democratic accountability we have. What we've decided in this country is to have full dem democratic accountability. And what does democratic, what does democratic accountability mean? Well, notice all the things that the British people have decided in recent years. Uh, they decided not to change the voting system. In Scotland, they decided not to go 
uh, independent. Uh, they decided pretty much to annihilate the Liberal Democrats. They decided to annihilate the Labour Party uh, in Scotland. Uh, and now they've decided to leave the European Union. I mean, this is the most extraordinary exercise of, of, um, of democratic power by the British people. And, and, and that's what I have in mind, because you'll not be able to name any equivalent decision that has been made at a European level. So if you're, if you're to take that to its logical conclusion then, um, parliamentary sovereignty being the key to Brexit, you presumably agree with those peers who are voting probably right now on um, having a meaningful parliamentary vote on the final deal that Theresa May comes back with from Europe. No, that is the most extraordinary bit of humbug. Uh, every, everybody knows that you know, this deal will be incredibly hard, hard fought over. There will be blood, toil, tears, and sweat in order to bring about this deal. Um, the reason you have an institution in government, an executive, a government, is because there are some things that a parliament cannot do. This is why you have different branches of government. A You've just parliament been extolling the virtues of parliamentary what? sovereignty, though. What? You've just been extolling the virtues of parliamentary sovereignty. I, um, parliamentary sovereignty is absolutely supreme. By six to one, parliament voted to have a referendum. Uh, this week, parliament is voting to trigger uh, Article 50. In the House of Commons, I think 500 members of parliament voted to trigger Article 50. But what you can't have is Parliament uh, conducting the negotiation. This is just complete common sense. Uh, supposing this group of people here, and you're only about a third of the size of the House of Commons, people in this room at the moment, how would you go and negotiate with the European Union? It's just completely bonkers. No, there will be a deal which is done by the government, having been set on its way by, uh, by Parliament, there is absolutely no way that Parliament can then say, oh, well, we don't like the deal, as though the European Union is then going to change its mind. No, this is nakedly an attempt to thwart the will of the British people. That's, that's absolutely all it is. And, I mean, you can see by reading the list of people who signed up to it uh, what their intention is. Just to revert to your earlier point about what kind of deal we're going to end up to, do you think it's a disaster if we have to revert to WTO rules, or is that okay, fine by you? Well, I observe that Japan and China and the United States uh, managed to trade quite successfully with the European Union. Uh, none of these countries is a part of the single market. Uh, indeed, I think you know, we're quite worried about the penetration uh, of uh, Chinese and Japanese and United States goods into our market. So I guess if those countries can um, get by with uh, WTO rules, um, we certainly can. Uh, the, the initial reaction to Brexit was a devaluation of the pound against the euro of about 10%, which is, I think, about twice as much as the external tariff. So even if the external tariff had existed at that point, we would have had a 5% advantage. Uh, the currency markets have now uh, spot, spotted this point, uh, and the pound is back to um, about 115 against the euro, which is actually a good deal better than it was uh, at the beginning of 2012, uh, when there was no Brexit, and as far as I know, no one was going around saying we had a currency crisis. People, it suggested, voted for Brexit because they actually wanted to reduce immigration. Do you think they're going to get what they want on that? Or is actually immigration going to keep on soaring? And, and actually, that would be quite good for the economy if it did. Ah, oh, I'm so pleased you raised this. I knew there was another point I meant to raise under, is politics stranger than fiction? Uh, in my view, immigration will be higher after Brexit, uh, not lower. Uh, and is that a good thing for the economy? Um, well, I, I think it's... Uh, I mean, you know, one I, in four I, I think it will meet economic demand. Um, whether it's a good thing that uh, something will have happened that people felt they'd voted against, I, I don't know. I think it would be difficult for the government to, to, to deal with that. I mean, let, let, me, let me go back a stage. What I think has been happening for years in this country, under, under all governments, is that there's a group of British people who don't participate in the labor market. They come from chaotic families. Uh, they may have drug problems in the families, you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, they have very minimal education. They're, they're not well motivated to work. 
And dealing with these people is very, very difficult. So what successive British governments have done is they have imported well-motivated migrant labor to take up the slack. I don't blame governments for this because dealing with the people who are not suited to the labor market is not only costly and difficult, it's also, it's also ethically very challenging because you know, these people we find out from research are falling behind at the age of two. So you know, is, is the government going to intervene and become a sort of parent to vast numbers of people? It raises enormous ethical questions. So that's what's been going on. Uh, and in my view, it's what's going to continue to go on. But I mean, just to take two sectors, let's take the City of London, the financial institutions, they will want to recruit more globally than they've done before. Uh, they will want to take lots of people from Singapore and Australia and from uh, Taiwan, I don't know, from all over the world, uh, because they'll want to be highly competitive with New York City, which is the true um, competitor. And then if you think about the um, London in the other sense, the London that many of us here live in, uh, London you know, depends to a huge extent, as I say, on well-motivated immigrant labor. And none of that, as I can see it, is going to change. And I do think the government will have a difficulty in explaining this at the end of the entire process. I might just say that in the near term, um, the national living wage is coming in. I think it's set at about nine pounds. Uh, in my view, this will lead to an enormous flow of people from the rest of the European Union, uh, coupled with the fact that they'll, they'll have the idea there's a closing down sale. But you know, this, this uh, you know, I suppose our national minimum wage is going to be six times the average wage in Romania. I mean, it's absolutely inevitable that the, uh, that the flow of people will increase, in my view. I mean, do you think, given the rest of the European Union faces what you've described as an existential threat, do you think that Angela Merkel might end up compromising on freedom of movement? Yes, yes, thank you. Politics stranger than fiction. While we are busy leaving the single market. Why? Because we're told that free movement of people is essential to it. You may remember that I told you earlier that it is not. This is a fiction. But while we are leaving the single market, because our European Union partners have told us that free movement of people is essential, the European Union is moving away from free movement of people. Uh, for Angela Merkel to win her election, for Macron or anybody else, to head off uh, Marine Le Pen, they're going to have to promise new restrictions. Fillon has already said he's going to re-establish French borders. In Southeast Europe, barbed wire is going up to stop people moving. So here is a terrific irony that we are going to leave because of the free movement of people while the free movement of people breaks down in the European Union. I mean, of course, I introduced you as Michael Portillo, but your full name, I think I'm right in saying, is Michael Denzel Xavier. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Portillo? Perhaps you'd like to give us the... Miguel answer. Denzel Javier Portillo. There you go. Um, your father was Spanish, your mum Scottish, and your father, I wanted to focus on him for a minute, worked in a, a refugee camp um, for evacuated Spanish children, I think I'm right in saying. I just wondered what he would have thought of the government reneging on its deal to house... Uh, refugee children from Calais? Well, it's, uh, my father's not here, so I can't ask him. But funnily enough, uh, it wasn't a refugee camp. The, um, refugee children came on, over after the bombing of Guernica, and they were set up in sort of houses, in institutions all over Britain. Uh, and my father and mother met looking after refugee children in uh, Oxfordshire. Well, I spoke to one of those children um, on Thursday. He's now 87 years old. He was seven years old when he came over as a refugee child. I said to him, how did you vote? He said, I voted Brexit. Uh, I was, you know, I had not expected that. So I said, oh, why, why did you vote Brexit? Well, here was a man who's lived here since he was seven years old. He said, uh, the things I valued about Britain since I arrived here uh, 80 years ago, I see being eroded. Now, I'm not, this is not my argument, it's his argument. He said, I see the things that, brought, that attracted me about Britain. By the way, he, had to, he made a conscious decision not to return to Spain, but to stay here uh, for another uh, 80 years. He said, I see the things that mattered to me about Britain being eroded. That's why I voted for Brexit. So uh, I think things are not quite as straightforward as you think. I know that Brexiteers are commonly 
uh, shown as being sort of Neanderthal morons, uh, but, but actually we're not all in that category. Um, just a couple more questions, then I will open it out to the audience. But uh, I couldn't resist asking you. You were talking about the Conservatives facing an existential crisis. Um, you've just had Theresa May win a by-election for the first time in decades. Governing party wins a by-election. Do you think Theresa May is another Maggie? Um, I don't think Theresa May is another Maggie. Um, but I, I can answer it in one sentence. Theresa May, during the referendum campaign, was in favour of remaining and now she's in favor of Brexit. Um, Margaret Thatcher would never have found herself on different sides of the same question. Uh, she knew what she thought, she said what she thought, she stuck to what she thought. And just finally, a personal note, I mean, you brought up the bucket load of shit. Um, <laughs> I was going to. Um, I mean, it was a, a horribly public humiliation, wasn't it? I just wondered how long it took you to get to the point of making jokes at your own expense about it and how you process that and in the process what advice you can give to David Cameron who's probably licking his wounds about the bucket load of shit over his head? Well, I can answer the first question very accurately. I was making jokes about it um, on the night uh, before, before the result was announced. I arrived at my count and the person who'd... Uh, when I arrived at the count, I already knew what the result was. Uh, you know, very often you do know long before. So I arrived at the count and I saw Stephen Twigg, who, was, who uh, had won the seat, and he, he was completely ashen. He, it, the colour had drained from his face. He was in shock. His life had been turned upside down. Uh, so um, as I arrived, I saw Stephen. I said, oh, come on, Stephen, pull yourself together, man. <laughs> uh, and then there's a moment where the returning officer uh, very quietly reads out the result to the candidates before it's read out publicly. Um, so that everybody knows what the result is. So he read out the result, and then he said, everybody happy? And I said, <laughs> and I said ecstatic. Um, so I was making jokes about it before the result was even announced. Um, you have to understand that um, what mattered to me was being in government. And there was no chance that the Conservatives were going to be in government. That was all over. Um, losing my seat was, in a way, an extra blow, but only in a way, because I would have been expected to run for the Conservative leadership. If I'd been really unlucky, I would have won the Conservative leadership. And to lead a party of 160 members of Parliament after a grotesque defeat like that, when Tony Blair was in the ascendant, would have been absolute hell. And that absolute hell was experienced by William Hague and not by me. Uh, and I could see that, and I, even in the moment, I, I saw the relief. I knew why I should be relieved. What's your advice to David Cameron, who possibly isn't feeling quite so relieved? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's too late. He should have stayed in the House of Commons. Um, I don't like members of Parliament who, uh, sorry, I don't like Prime Ministers who use the House of Commons like a public convenience. You know, they, they pop in for a while, they become Prime Minister, and as soon as they've used the place, they leave it. Uh, you know, Tony Blair was the same. I, you know, for heaven's sake, let's, we ought to have Prime Ministers like, you know, Winston Churchill, who remained for decades after being Prime Minister, uh, giving us the benefit of uh, his uh, experience. So it's too late for my advice. My advice would have been stay in the House of Commons. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, George Osborne did. Future leader, George Osborne? It's not, it's not impossible that George Osborne will be a future leader. Um, you know, given that the Conservatives are very likely to win next time, um, that, that's a long stretch of being in office. And, uh, you know, unless there's an early election. Unless there's an early I don't election. think there'll be an early election. I, um, you know, along with uh, William Hague, of course, theoretically, I see the advantages of it. But, I mean, William Hague is writing a newspaper column uh, I've written a newspaper column. It's, you, you try desperately to think of something to say that will draw attention to your newspaper column. Uh, he's not serious. No one for a moment believes that Theresa May is going to call an election. Great. Let's have some questions from the audience. Um, to, uh, just here, third row back. Great. As a half Scot person, do you have a view on what will happen north of the border over the next couple of years? Do I have a view on what will happen in Scotland? Um, first of all, I'm, I'm outraged that we seem to find ourselves in a position 
where the Scottish National Party can trigger another referendum whenever it feels that the opinion polls are moving in its direction. I don't know how we got into this position. Since we had legislation on the last referendum, I really don't know why we didn't put in a 25-year uh, barrier that this question can't be open for 25 years. But we are where we are. Uh, my guess would be that um, the SNP have uh, pretty much teetered over the brink. In other words, they couldn't now not call for a referendum without loss of face. Um, I think it's hard for the British government to resist. But what I guess will happen is that uh, the British government will insist on it being after 2019, after the EU settlement has been made, the Brexit settlement. Uh, and I don't know how the Scots will vote. Um, because, uh, I, I mean, things are much worse now than they were the last time they voted, economically speaking. The oil revenues are at a tiny fraction of what was predicted by Alex uh, Salmond. The Scottish deficit is enormous. But as we know from Brexit, uh, it isn't economic arguments that matter. It is sentiment. Uh, and I don't know, in 2019, after Brexit, what the Scottish sentiment will be. And of course, I could hardly criticize a Scot if his or her sentiment were that uh, he or she felt more Scottish than anything else, since my sentiment has been that I feel more British than anything else. Front row, please. Uh, hello, uh, Sean uh, Curtin, a surveyor. Um, I think you're rather harsh on yourself, Michael. I think you're very much still in the uh, public consciousness, and it's not just insomniacs and perverts. <laughs> Uh, and uh, to illustrate this, just a week ago, when John Major gave his speech at Chatham House, Laura Koonsberg asked him, were there any current bastards in <laughs> Theresa May's cabinet? <laughs> to which he answered, you may think that, I couldn't possibly mm -hmm. comment. Which is a line from uh, Michael Dobbs's uh, brilliant trilogy. And by the way, you're a fantastic replacement, Michael. Uh, and when we look across the sea in America, we have Donald Trump tweeting at five o'clock in the morning, which very much reminds me of Ian Richardson or Kevin Spacey in the American version of House of Cards speaking to the camera and giving us their raw thoughts. So my question to you is, is politics becoming more like fiction? Um, the, um, yes, I, 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 I think it is. And, and maybe, maybe fiction uh, affects politics. I mean, the fiction that comes to mind when I watch House of Cards is uh, Shakespeare, is Macbeth. When he turns to the camera, it is, it is the soliloquy. It is Iago telling you why he's determined to do away with Othello and how he's going to use Desdemona as the weapon to destroy Othello. So it, it is, uh, or actually perhaps even closer, uh, given the existence of his wife, it is uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, the two plotters, and, we, uh, and we've even had the murders in the House of Cards plot, the American version, we have had the murders uh, which have got him to the throne. So Macbeth, it seems to me, is very clearly um, a, an inspiration. So, you know, having, having referred to Macbeth, uh, you know, clearly fiction has been in this place for a very long time. But yes, I, 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 do, I wish Michael Do Dobbs were here because I'm pretty sure that he would tell you that he wouldn't dare to have written things as outrageous as the things that have actually happened in the last few months. I mean, for this figure, Trump, uh, to come from nowhere, I mean, just an ordinary billionaire, uh, you know, rising to the top, it's, uh, it, it's extraordinary. It defies, it defies fiction. Uh, sorry, we're just no. trying to get through as many questions as possible. Just here, thank you. Very nice presentation, by the way. Um, thank you. Just a quick one. Uh, as a former Defence Secretary, how do you think you could do deal with Korea, North Korea? Huh. That's a very good question, sir. Don't give Donald Trump the nuclear codes, just a thought. <laughs> um, I was fortunate I never had to deal with anything as difficult as North Korea uh, in, its, in its present guise. Um, I was fortunate I didn't have to deal with Iraq, I didn't have to deal with Afghanistan. Uh, what I did at the time seemed difficult enough. Uh, I, I think I can only say something fairly trite, which is that the key to North Korea is China. Um, and I think uh, that's not a problem for us. Our relations with China are, on the whole, pretty good.
But I think as Donald Trump thinks out his priorities, uh, he, he does need to bear in mind that North Korea is an entirely unpredictable threat. I mean, one simply doesn't know what could happen there. A series of possibilities from the implosion of the regime, which I think must be quite likely, otherwise I don't think they would have taken such uh, care to assassinate the uh, half-brother, to um, a letting off of, of weaponry. And actually, we, you know, we're kind of seeing both things at the same time. Uh, China knows more about North Korea than anybody else. China has more influence on North Korea than anyone else. Therefore, I think one of our principal objectives of foreign policy should be the closest possible coordination uh, and, and reliance on Chinese advice about how to deal with this problem. Uh, I did take one from you in the last session. So um, just third row back, um, just here. Yeah, there's no female meerkats in the room. I'm really quite upset. Thank you. This on? Um, my question is kind of going a little bit back to the Brexit vote. Of course. Um, for me, the campaign seemed an absolute mess in terms of political fact and, getting back to the question, political fiction. Uh, myths, figures plucked out of thin air. Do you think the British public were informed enough in the first instance for a yes-no uh, vote on EU membership? And secondly, with such a small margin of 4%, do you think the government are right to be implementing a referendum result without a supermajority in place? Um, let me answer your second question first. Um, around the European Union, there have been many referendums in France, in Denmark, in Holland, uh, in Ireland. And uh, whenever the public has got the result wrong from the view of the establishment, they've simply been asked to vote again until they get the answer right. This is how democracy works in some of these countries. You may ask yourself, why did the British government not think of this as a way out? Why didn't they say, oh, let's have another negotiation and another referendum? The answer is Jerry Malone. Uh, Jerry Malone was a conservative uh, member of parliament who in a general election, I think in Winchester, uh, lost by seven votes to the Liberal Democrat candidate. There were 100 spoilt ballot papers. He appealed to the courts. The courts granted a re-election. The re-election was held two months later, <laughs> the same candidates and the same electorate. Jerry Malone, who had lost by seven votes, now lost by 23,000 votes. <laughs> the reason being that the British public does not like to be asked the same question twice. And I think there is a realization. By the way, our Scottish friends, I'd better bear this in mind as well. How will the Scots feel about being asked the same question twice? They may not uh, take so kindly to it. Um, and also, referring to what I said uh, in answer to the Scottish question, um, yes, I think they did know what they were voting about, because in the end, they were voting about what they felt. They voted with their hearts. Now, all sorts of different considerations may have gone into that. Yes, yeah, some people were worried about immigration. Some people were worried about sovereignty. Uh, my refugee child from Spain was worried about the, the wearing away of Britishness in our, in our way of life, in our institutions. Whatever it was, it was about their heart. And um, in my view, the um, Remain campaign was as incompetent as it possibly could be. Uh, the, the one thing I sort of consistently got right through the campaign, I kept saying, for Cameron to line up all the establishment, big business, the banks, the Confederation of British Industry, the Economist newspaper, the Financial Times, President Obama, all the political parties except for UKIP. If you line up all the establishment, you are offering an opportunity for the British public to kick the establishment very hard where it hurts. And they say if it's good for those bankers and if it's good for those business people, it sure isn't going to be good for me. Follow up on that, does it not matter that the British public was misled about all that money, 350 million quid, going into the NHS? No, it doesn't matter at all, because they were also misled about the revenge budget. By now, George Osborne would have brought a revenge budget, and we would all have been plunged into some kind of uh, ice age of economic austerity. And what has actually happened is the economy has been growing steadily ever since. Uh, yes, there were misrepresentations on both sides, I mean, personally, I believe the misrepresentations on the Remain side were much stronger. But I'm not going to spend the rest of the, of the, of the afternoon arguing that with you. 
Uh, question on the end here, please. Have we got the mic? Great, thank you. Uh, Michael, great presentation, thanks. Thank you. Um, you. You said you could justify our electoral system, uh, which, which I think I'd argue is pretty undemocratic in that if you don't live in a marginal seat, you don't really have a voice in, in the process at all. But I'll see how you justify it. Well, um, I think that's uh, less true than it would have been uh, a while ago. I mean, for a very long time, I expect most Scottish people thought uh, they had no uh, effect because their seats were Labour generation after generation. The Labour Party now hardly exists in Scotland, uh, certainly as measured by the uh, UK uh, Parliament. Uh, before that, by the way, the Scottish Conservatives have been pretty much annihilated. They've now made their way back. Um, you know, around the country, there have been uh, big changes. I, I think I'm right, uh, Cathy will know better than I, but I think, you know, the Labour vote in Stoke-on-Trent 20 years ago was 67%. Now it's 37%. Uh, 30 percentage points have gone missing. So I, I'm not sure anymore what we mean by only having a, a vote uh, in a marginal seat. But let me tell you why I think the system is, is, is a good one. It is because when a member of parliament is elected, that member of parliament knows that the chances of being elected next time depend very crucially on how well he or she does his job uh, and whether uh, they meet the satisfaction of their local constituents. Uh, when I'm in Spain, I talk to members of parliament and I say, um, you know, what will happen in the next election? And they say, oh, it's absolutely fine. I'm number two on the socialist list. So no member of the public has had any say whatsoever in selecting this person. What they've done is they've ingratiated themselves with their party hierarchy, and they've, they've found their way uh, uh, number two on the list. And you may be absolutely sure that the, the number one and the number two and the number three have done the most brown nosing of anybody in the entire country. So you can guarantee you're electing a bunch of, you know, brown nosers. Now, I also think that there is advantage in electing generally speaking, majority governments uh, that get on and, and do stuff. And here I would cite the opposite end of the spectrum, which is uh, in Israel. In Israel, they have a perfectly proportionate system uh, so that the quite extreme parties, the ultra parties, are well represented in parliament. And what this means is that any government depends on a coalition with the extremists and ultras to form a government. If you want to know why Israel is building in the settlements, it is because of proportional representation. Michael Portillo, thank you very much. That thank was you. very entertaining, very engaging, and I think I speak for everyone in saying that Lord Dobbs couldn't have said it any better himself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.